A childhood dream brought Val Gruner to Africa and the remote Kalahari Desert of Botswana. His work at Grasslands Game Farm, running a volunteer project and caring for captive rogue lions and wild dogs, is fraught with conflict and danger. But rescuing a dying lion cub changed his life forever. Serga is a hand-reared captive, born of wild parents. By rights, she should be dead or in a cage. But Val is determined to give her a chance at a free life and a hunting ground of her own. Can he save Serga from a life in captivity? Can he help her rediscover the wild predator within her? Val Gruner found his dream on Grasslands Farm, a two-hour trek over rugged dirt to the nearest town. He also found a very special friend called Serga. Together, here in the vast sands of the Kalahari Desert, Val and Serga the lioness are living an extraordinary story. It's a story of friendship which blurs the boundaries between species. It's the story of an emotional connection which challenges accepted wisdom. It's the story of a man's humanity and his willingness to sacrifice and persevere to keep his promises. And a lioness's unconditional trust in that man. Right now, the story's ending remains uncertain. Because Grasslands, the remote 10,000 hectare game farm where it all begins, lies on the front line of a century-old war between man and predator. Where friendship between a lion and a man is unthinkable. Because here, the life of a lion is worth little more than the price of a bullet. As far back as Val can remember, he wanted to become a wildlife veterinarian in Africa. But there was no money for that. The young German was undaunted. He left his homeland to work for a year in the frozen oil fields of northern Canada. The money he earned there enabled him to travel to Africa, to qualify as a wildlife guide and game tracker, and to spend time as a volunteer at a wildlife rehabilitation center in Namibia. Namibia gave him his first taste of the great Kalahari Desert. But it was here in Botswana where Val's dreams of Africa, his passion for predators, and his guiding and tracking skills finally merged. Hey, guys, stop it. Hmm? Go. Go because Grasslands Game yeah. Farm is uniquely Go. Go positioned. And with the exception of Serga, all the predators Val cares for are wild rogues destined to return to the wild. We're basically bordering Central Kalahari Game Reserve, which is a, a massive park. It's, it's bigger than Denmark, so it, it's unimaginable how, how large it is. And nobody really knows about it. It's very empty. There's not much happening. So it's, for me, it's probably the favorite place in Africa. And it's, it's so amazing just living right, right next to it. And all the predators that, that cause these problems walk from, from the park right into the farming areas be, behind me, which are even bigger than this national park. But, but they don't know, these fences don't keep them back, so they just walk in because they're looking for a new home, and that's, that's why we have these lions sitting in a cage. Grasslands is surrounded on three sides by cattle farms. Beyond its fourth border lies the 52,000 square kilometers Central Kalahari Game Reserve. The second largest contiguous terrestrial game reserve in the world. It's one of the last lion strongholds in Africa and home to the Kalahari lion, a subspecies adapted to desert conditions. Around 600 Kalahari lions still survive in this vast wilderness.
they are in no immediate danger of extinction. But like all lions in Africa, they are finding it increasingly difficult to connect to new bloodlines, and in time the all-important gene pool will be eroded. 90% of Africa's lions have disappeared over the past 40 years. Commercial lion hunting is banned in Botswana, but in the dark of night, lions can stray into cattle farms. More than 10% of lions from the northern part of the Central Kalari Game Reserve are killed by farmers every year. Because when water and prey are scarce, predators cross the fences into the cattle farms. A Kalahari cattle farm is an oasis in a sea of sand. Boreholes tap into underground aquifers and water is piped to people and livestock at outlying cattle posts. That's where lions, wild dogs and leopards find easy prey. A young farmer can lose his livelihood to predators within weeks. Botswana law allows him to protect it. Willy de Graaf was born and bred into the frontier lifestyle and hunting culture of the Kalahari Desert, where shooting a lion is the stuff of legends. Then he realized that lion hunting would silence the roar of the Kalahari lion forever. I'm one of those farmers that uh, shot quite a number of lions, and uh, it's not an achievement. It's a sad thing to shoot a lion. There was a killing instinct in me because of, of, you know, the stories that I heard, all the hunting stories from the Bushmen. And, uh, you know, I think maybe that was one of the reasons why I also shot a, uh, some lions. Many of the stories of the Bushman was about uh, how dangerous a lion is. With regret came a burning desire to make amends and to help save predators in Kalahari. In 2007, Vili changed grasslands, his game farm, into a conservation and cultural venue and a sanctuary for captive rogue predators. Nowadays, visitors come to interact with the sound people who shaped Billy's childhood. They also follow the work done here with captive rogue lions and African wild dogs. He's alive because the Botswana government gave Vili permission to capture him and care for him until he can be moved back into a wildlife area in Botswana. lions at uh, grassland is actually supposed to be dead lions. They are not supposed to be alive because they were problem lions that was actually su supposed to be shot by, by me or other farmers, but instead of shooting them, I saved them from a bullet. When a rogue lion enters a farm, there is no time to call a vet. As a farmer, I'm not allowed to use a dart gun. So I actually risked my life by capturing this lion. I took a net and uh, we followed this lion, problem lion, with some of the Bushman trackers, which is the best trackers in the world. And when we approached the lion, you know, a lion, when you, when you corner a lion, he gets aggressive and he charges towards you. And me and one person were standing in the back of the vehicle with a net, lift up, and when the lion jumped towards us, we throw the net over the lion. And that's how we captured these lions. And when you throw the net over the lion, uh, the lion gets tangled in the net because the head of the lion can go through the, the, 
the whole of the net, but the rest of the body cannot go through it. Billy and his team of sunbushmen know the dangers. They've done it before. Every capture is a life-threatening operation because the lions cannot be sedated. The first priority is to secure the lion's feet. They can't go near it, so they use hooking sticks and ropes. Once the feet are bound and it's down, the men get off the vehicles to pull it into the waiting trap. It's still high risk, but the chance of fatality or injury is greatly reduced. Once the gate is dropped, the capture is secure. It takes less than 30 minutes, but it requires a team of 14 men and two vehicles. And once the lion is inside the, the cage, we drop the gate and that's how we capture these lions. Not only males are rogues, sometimes pregnant females give birth to cubs. I never tried to raise my lion cubs by hand because when you relocate them back into the wild, they should be as wild as possible. In nature, we all know that when a, a female lion is about to give birth, she goes away from the pride, give birth to her cubs, and after six weeks, she brings the cubs to the, to the pride, and the pride accepts this uh, cubs. But with, uh, in captivity here, it, it was uh, impossible. And when one of the female lions here gave birth, uh, two of the small cubs were killed by older cubs, and uh, the one cub was still there. So this uh, Valentin then called me on the radio and asked me whether they can take this cub because she's also going to be killed. And uh, I gave him permission to take this cup away, save her from being killed, and he took her to the volunteer camp. Many people will look at it in a different way, maybe, but uh, I just thought this young man would love to raise a cup. I would also love to do that when I was young, but if you do that, you have to spend a lot of time with this cup and I couldn't do it. So I gave uh, Valentin a chance to adapt the cup and look after it and raise it, which he has done very successful. So when I got Suga, she was just this, this tiny, weak little line, 1.5 kilogram and, and barely able to move. And we st I started feeding her so much, and six feedings a day, four feedings a night, and, and because she was only one line, I took about one hour on every feeding because there's no competition. Nobody was was there. Normally, lions will go crazy and they, they they drink as quick as possible. And she took her time and had had no no problems. And now, so about ten hours a day, you're busy just feeding a line, and then I had to run the volunteer program at the same time. Um, and every night for the first eight months I was sleeping outside with her because it was also very cold. It's in winter here, it's almost at zero degrees or minus degrees at night and the, the little lion was, was sleeping outside. I never wanted her to get used to, to tents and, and things where we are. So I stayed outside with her every night and got up four times a night to feed her again and again. Val became mother, father and protector to the traumatized young cub. So it, it went slowly, but she, she started trusting me and we developed a bond and she would follow me around. I, I didn't have to look after, she'd always be with me. And it just got more and more and more that I started taking her for walks and she would never leave me alone. She, she's just following and, and I didn't even have to call the lion. The, the moment the lion couldn't see me anymore, it's just a tiny thing and she's tired laying in, in the bush, but then the moment I'm gone, it starts screaming and calling for you. Even when they're tiny little things, they, they want to hunt everything. Anything that moves, she would run. When she was about three months old, she would run after any giraffe that she sees and then go for it. And it's amazing to, to just see how, how that instinct is in them. 
The name Suga is from my childhood when I was a kid. My, my parents used to show me this movie, it's called Suga a Lioness, which is about a little child, Ule, who's a local kid that grows up in the, in the bush in the village. And at the same time, a lioness is born in that area. And now the mother brings that little lion cub into his, his tent at night. And so they develop a bond and, and grow up together. And they get, they get separated and the, the kid becomes a, a slave. And, and in the end, the lion saves him. It's, it's, it's a lovely movie for, for children. And yeah, when I got Suga, I decided it's a good, good name to name a little lioness. Since, since I've raised Suga, she She's just become my, my best friend out here, and if, uh, there's nobody else that stays here the whole time. It's just me, and she, she's an amazing little cat. You, on the walks, you can watch her when I play with her. She, she gives you so much love, and, and she really gives me a, another very good reason to, to stay here forever and never leave her again. Raising Serga, in addition to caring for rogue predators, oh. is a 24-hour job. Val has no regrets. At 16 months old, she weighs a hefty 90 kilogram. She's a highly social cat, and she craves attention and physical contact. In the wild, a cub her age would be out with a pride, tagging along on the hunt, jostling and bonding with siblings. Strengthening bonds before the hunt is instinctive and all important. It cements the pride and fosters cohesion. What do you think? Will it kill a wildebeest? Okay, she's ready. Val's responsibilities make it impossible for them to be together all the time. Serga makes up for lost time. He doesn't know what the embrace means to Serga. She has imprinted on him from a young age. And he doesn't know if she sees herself as a lion or a human. She's had no contact with other lions since she was 10 days old. She looks and acts like a lion. But would she recognize lions if she saw them in the wild? Imprinting on Val could affect her future. Young lions learn the landmarks and resources of their territory from their mothers. Val is all Serga has. And Grassland's 10,000 hectares is their territory. After 16 months, Serga is familiar with the physical features of their territory. Now she has to learn the look and scent of the antelope that live here. Water is the lifeblood of this great thirst land. Rain is rapidly filtered through vast expanses of sand, leaving little on the surface and what's left quickly evaporates in the heat. Kalahari lions learn to use water as bait, because without it, nothing survives. Val and Serga don't understand the power of predators command around water yet. They're still forging and strengthening their unlikely alliance. Everything else has to wait. Yeah. Val's guiding and tracking skills are vital. He knows the animals and the plant species, and he's learned to read and follow spoor. Serga's knowledge of tracking and following animals is instinctive. The hollow is freshly dug by an oryx in search of roots and tubers. The oryx is long gone, but the plants here are a treasure trove. Val wants to explore the relationship between the animals and their habitat. Sugar, come on. It's a nice plant. Wishman said you can boil it and drink it. In addition to his work with predators and with Serga, Val runs the Medisa Volunteer Project. Yeah. Plant <laughs> identification is part of the program. The Devil's Thorn's roots have proven medicinal properties. He wants to take a sample back to camp. Yeah. Almost 
got it. Almost got it. Take it here. Here. <laughs> Don't care. No, now this this dream that I have and, and the life I'm I'm living here, I want to to share with people, which is why we, we started the volunteer program, especially to bring young people into Africa and not just as a tourist that's there for two nights, really to, for, for a few weeks or months even, and give them experience that in the bush, about the bush, they're helping at the same time. And along the way, I've learned a lot of things which, which I never thought I'd, I'd think about that way bef before. And, and it's very important to me to be able to, to share this passion and to really try to, to save lions because if, if the future gener generations will not know about it, with the lions will be lost. Val and his friend and business partner, Mikkel de Garth, co-founded the Medisa Wildlife Project to make young people aware of the realities facing wildlife in Africa. Medisa is the Setswana word for guardian. Val runs the day-to-day -day activities, Mikkel manages the business side of things from Denmark, and Gert, the wild ostrich, visits the camp from time to time for water and for company. Grasslands is the perfect backdrop for an awareness project. Val's decision to rescue Serga has long-term consequences. In Botswana, hand-reared lions can never be returned to national reserves. But Val's determined that she won't be just another captive pet. The only way she will have a fighting chance at living a relatively free life is if she can hunt. But both Val and Serga are novices at the game of hunting. They know little about survival in the Kalahari. Hunting wild game is extremely dangerous. Oryx carry lethal weapons. No man has ever hunted on foot and unarmed with a lion in the wild before. Val cannot teach Serga to hunt. All he can give her are opportunities to develop the predatory instinct she was born with. But both novice hunters have much to learn. Right now, neither would be able to survive on their own in the wild. And they have no experienced wild hunters to learn from. Serga is young and she's inexperienced, but she's a lion. Hunting is in her blood, but it's not easy. Oryx are fast and strong. She'll have to up her game if she's to be successful. Sega's never been part of a hunting pride. She's never watched the pride move into ambush or take down prey. Val simply took her out in the wild to provide stimulus and exercise. He never expected her to hunt, but Sega shifted the goalposts. She changed their lives forever. She made her first kill. It was a, a heart to beast. And probably one of the most, I don't know, overwhelming moments I've ever had. Lions are very, very crazy about their food and very protective. So normally you, you know when a lion has meat, you, you can't get near it. Now she's killing the heart to beast, but she's young, so it, it took her a bit of time and, and you'd start feeling sorry for the antelope but you're so happy that your lion has, has caught something because it's what they're supposed to do. And after a while, she came back from the kill. She came up to me, gave me a little hug, rubbed her head on my head, and then she walked back to, to her antelope. So I, I just decided I'll try and I walk back with her. And she had absolutely no problem and actually helped her to kill it and then cut it open for her because she was very, very exhausted. And that's probably the most amazing thing I have experienced. This first kill was pivotal because Serga showed no signs of aggression towards Val. Until this moment, he'd considered hunting with her impossible. Because lions are notorious for their aggressive behavior around food. 
If Sega turns on him at a kill, it would be disastrous. He cannot survive a food fight with a hostile predator. But her behavior gives him a unique opportunity. If he can hunt with her, she can rediscover and hone her hunting instincts. And if she can hunt on her own, he can create a large fenced hunting ground for her where she can live a relatively normal life. He trusts Serga's genetic heritage. Yeah, it's quite amazing to see her instincts and all the things she just does without me ever showing her is probably more that I can learn than, than I could ever teach her. Hunting with a large predator will always be a calculated risk. There are no guarantees. There's no one to ask for advice. But Val is her family. He's all she knows. She's young and easily frightened by the unknown. But she's willing to learn and overcome her fears. For Val being here with Serga is a dream come true. No, it's really been my dream since I'm a, a small child, three or four years old, that I, I wanted to live in the bush in Africa with, with lions and, and just be in this, this environment here. And yeah, it's just amazing. Now I'm, I actually made it, I live here. I, I've raised a lioness, I can go hunting with, with that lion together and, and I spend every day of my life out here. And there's no way to describe how it feels like you. You're just simply living the dream you've always had and, and it's worked out. The dream is drawing him ever deeper into the complex world of a lion. She has an insatiable need for closeness and touch, but sometimes, when instinct takes over, she withdraws from him. Her body language changes. There's an elant in the bush up ahead. Then she looks back at Val. She's checking his position. He's part of her hunt. The Ilan Bull has seen her. Taking it on shows courage, confidence, and inexperience. But it's the only way to learn her limitations. But the chase is too long for a short distance sprinter. Val cannot keep up. It's enough just to be part of the hunt. Serga's tired but restless. She knows the Ilan is still out there. But there will be other animals, other chances. She's learning that chasing prey in the scorching sand is hard physical work. She'll need strength and stamina as well as speed if she's to survive as a lone huntress. She'll need knowledge and cunning to outwit prey animals. And she'll have to come to terms with thirst. Thirst is part of being a lion in the Kalahari. Come on, Jigga. Let's go. Kalahari lions often survive on the fluids in their prey. If they cannot kill, they die of thirst. To Val, these three to four hours alone with Serga are precious. It is only private time. The care of the captives and the activities of the Medisa Wildlife Project take up every other waking moment. Serga, come on. Come on. Yeah. 
Sergei uses the time with Val to bond and practice her takedown skills. Not on the sand grass, they too small. Val is just the right size. Yeah. He's the ultimate lion sofa. And this nope, lion no. sofa belongs to her. She refuses to share it with yeah. anyone else. No, no. I chose Botswana because yeah. there's, there's not many people here and the, the wildlife that's left is amazing and not just inside national parks, also outside protected areas. And the Kalahari is this huge empty wilderness which is beautiful. It's a, it's a freedom that you have out here that I've never seen anywhere else in the world and it it just really moved me and made me want to come here and, and help saving it. Co-founder of Medisa, Mikkel Lagarth, sacrificed his own African dreams to manage the business side of things from Denmark, but visits Botswana as often as he can. The idea for our project started in, the, in Namibia, uh, where Val and I was working. And we quickly became good friends. And, uh, and one night we were just talking about what would we actually like to do in the future. And we've both been hey. dreaming about hey. working with wildlife and animals since we were kids. So uh, that was the first thing that came up to our mind. And, um, and after a few days we were still talking a bit about it and how can we uh, actually do this. And, um, and then we decided, okay, let's try and go for it. Like we only get this one shot, so we might as well just try and go with, with our dreams. And uh, we both went back to Europe, so we could try and actually put this idea into a bit more of a planning. And we started to look into different African countries. And uh, after a bit of research, we found out that uh, Botswana didn't have a similar program to what we would like to start. And then after a bit more research, we also discovered that the Kalahari lion um, was uh, in a big decline due to the uh, conflict between the, the lions and the pharmacy in the area. So we just tried, uh, so we just uh, wanted to, to go to Botswana, basically. And uh, after some time, we, uh, we met Willy de Raff, who share our passion for, uh, for the big cats. Like he's been uh, he's been capturing lions because he didn't want them to get shot, and then the idea was to get them relocated into uh, some safe areas here in Botswana. And at the time where we approached him and talked to him, he was looking for someone to manage his lions, and uh, and we saw a great possibility that both of us could could benefit from uh, from this idea. And uh, and then we we agreed on that we could start. Uh, building our camp here and slowly start our volunteer program. And in the meanwhile, he's been teaching us about how the situation is really here. Because as uh, many other people outside of Africa, we have some sort of idea <clears throat> or that we know there, are, there is a problem uh, between farmers and lions and just the general wildlife de decline. Uh, but he was really teaching us uh, like how is it working just here in this area. He has a great understanding of the whole situation here in the Kalahari region. Um, so he's been a great mentor to, uh, to, for us and for, for the program we run now. We all know that uh, the shooting of lions is a very sensitive thing because the numbers and the population of lions is, is dropping, uh, you know, uh, but uh, in Botswana it works like this, that if a lion comes for, from outside into a farm, uh, you are allowed to protect your livestock, so you are allowed to shoot a lion when it kills one of your animals. And I'm one of those farmers that uh, that did shoot uh, uh, quite a number of lions, trying to protect my animals. No one understands the challenges faced by commercial and subsistence farmers in tribal areas in Botswana better than Vili does. Cattle farming is deeply ingrained in Botswana culture. It represents status and a secure income. Predators are a major threat to farmers' livelihoods. You can imagine if this beautiful animal is killed by a lion, 
then you realize why uh, the, the, the predators like a lion is still being killed and shot by the farmers because you can't afford to lose a bull like this. But you must understand the conflict between a predator and a farmer because you know, you don't want to kill a lion or shoot a lion. You also don't want to lose an animal that cost you uh, 45,000 rand. There are no easy answers here. Hungry lions don't distinguish between wild game and livestock, and angry farmers don't ask questions before shooting. But lions are not the only headache farmers have. When lions are killed, their most successful competitors take the gap. Fewer than 200 African wild dogs still survive in the central Kalahari Game Reserve. They're part of the most important interconnected population that remains of the species. They too are killed by farmers and tribesmen wherever they're found. The captive wild dogs at grasslands are part of the unfolding tragedy of a species on the brink of extinction. Well, if, if you look at the wild dogs, it's, it's such a sad story. They're such amazing animals. and and not the danger to, to us as people at all. And it's very touching to, to think about the fact that they're almost disappearing and we, we're not really doing anything against it at the moment. They're still becoming less and less and less and farmers shoot them. Well, I want to save the, the wild dogs simply because there's not many around in captivity. We have the chance to keep some of them and keep them healthy, vac vaccinate them for rabies and breed in a way that they're healthy, that we can make sure they're, they're not inbreeding. The Kalahari is a very big ecosystem which is still functioning. They come from here and the only way that why they have to sit behind the fence right now is because they will walk into some of the neighboring cattle farms and get shot if I let them out. Well, I really want to make a difference for these animals and try to, to save as many of them as possible. And whether we can just do this in a small area in cages for now and maybe release them into bigger areas at some stage if we can get funding to fence in and make sure they cannot escape into the cattle farms. But I'm really hoping that for the future we can make a difference and, and bring these animals, the numbers up again instead of just watching them drop and disappear from, from Africa. Saving wild dogs on farms is hard because most farmers want them exterminated. There are no telephones on this vast wild frontier. Billy visits the families living at isolated cattle posts in person. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. He provides them with basic provisions such as meat, maize meal, tea and medicine, as well as the latest news from the outside world. And they give him fresh updates on predator movements, injuries, and outbreaks of disease in the areas around them. One of my guys just told me that uh, a cow was killed by some wild dogs. Yeah, you know, it's not easy to track a wild dog down because, you know, once you the wild dog kills a, a cow, by the time that you reach there, they are going to the next paddock and another cow is killed. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a serious problem and, uh, you know, it will always stay a problem. By the time we see the vultures, you know, it means that the, the wild dogs already left the carcass. Because once the, wild, uh, the, uh, the vultures uh, comes down, the dogs are gone. The wild dogs killed a heifer in a remote off-road area. The men have to track them and chase them back across the border fence into the buffer zone. The sun's ability to find and follow tracks on foot and from horseback is legendary and well-deserved. They're tracking a pack of eight dogs with young pups. It will be another hard day in the saddle.
Every two weeks, Vili drives the 60 kilometers from his cattle farm to grasslands to discuss the care of the captive predators. Ensuring that they're fed regularly is a priority. Val's first months in the Kalahari were a steep learning curve. Maintaining equipment and infrastructure in such a remote area is a huge challenge. He also never expected that he'd be hunting and slaughtering game. But the strict realist and the idealistic young dreamer with the bare feet work well together. Willie. Yes, well done. How, How are you? How are you? Fine, thanks, and you? No, I'm good. I'm good, oh, Hunting tomorrow. Are you not married yet? No. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm not yet. Yeah. We want okay. to feed the lions tomorrow, or you should mm -hmm. feed them. So I want you to do the shooting tomorrow for me. Okay. Uh, so I want you to shoot four wildebeest. Okay, I can do that. Okay. Right. When he first arrived, Val dreamed only of saving the lions of Africa and helping captive predators. But captive lions and wild dogs cannot hunt. They have to be fed. Someone has to provide the food. Come on, let's go. Shooting wild animals was the hardest of all lessons and still goes against the grain. Yeah, I really don't like the the hunting here, but um, we have to we have to feed the lions and well, I mean we try to do it as as good as possible with the with the shooting that we don't wound anybody. And at the end of the day, we have too many wildebeest in the park because the lions are locked in a cage at the moment and can't hunt on them on their own. So we we just have to to do the hunting for them until we can get them back outside so they can do it themselves. You see that they had a fight. Mm. He's got his, his lip is scarred. The captive predators are fed twice a week. Getting the portions right is important. Slaughtering was a foreign concept to Val when he first arrived. The San Bushman had to show him how to divide the meat into portions for the different captives. Nowadays, it's just one of many tasks that have to be performed and he and his staff handle it as a matter of course. But he remembers what it's like to be from a first world country where meat comes neatly packaged. For most volunteers, their first slaughter is a life-changing experience that forces them to confront the realities of life in rural Africa. Once they understand that the captives would starve without their help, most are happy to get their hands dirty. None of the captives they care for are tame or grateful. Now these four boys, they kept jumping out of their big enclosure where their moms were. They even jumped into another lion cage and killed one of our females. So I had to, to catch them like once a week. They used to be out or even more. And we'd use a net to throw on them and bring them back into the cage or trap them or just chase them. So they, they don't like me anymore at the moment. Um, but since they're a big threat to the people that are here when they jump out of their big cage, we had to lock them up in, in the small one, which is a sad situation at the moment, but we, we cannot change it right now. We're busy fixing the big cages with electric wires so we can bring them back into the big camps. In the wild, these young males would be nomads. They'd be sneaking between territories, living on small mammals and scavenging for anything they can find. Here they are fed twice a week. They quickly learn that the sound of the tractor engine means food is on its way. Tempers and stress levels are high all round. But once the tractor arrives at the enclosure and the smell of the meat is in their noses, most captives calm down and wait their turn. But lions are individuals. This lioness hates being captive. She wants to hunt her own food. 
She's escaped so often that she had to be confined here until her enclosure is electrified. Okay, pretty good. Do your jump. Do it. Val feels sorry for her, but he has to be careful. She's clawed him twice before. It's a big one. I hope we can fit this nicely. Slowly, sweetie, slowly. Wow. And now it's okay. You have it. Yeah. Come on. Nothing pacifies her, not even food. Two times she had me like this. Arm all of a sudden comes through like, and and then you're hanging on the fences. One claw is enough. <laughs> right now, Val is responsible for 20 lions and six African wild dogs, as well as two shy female leopards. Willie's efforts to capture rogue predators have paid off. Ten lions and five wild dogs have been moved back into the wild by the wildlife department as part of various research projects. The six males are settled in their large 10 hectare enclosure, but they haven't lost their competitive edge. They were captured because they killed cattle on farms. They're still as wild as ever. And like all wild lions, they fight and compete for food. Even the thin male recovering from a serious injury to his jaw doesn't hold back. In the wild, only the biggest and the strongest males win a pride in a territory. These males came into the farms as nomads. Now their roars warn outsiders as far as eight kilometers away, this is our territory. Keep out or die. What I noticed since I started with the lions here, that uh, the lions from outside is not entering the farm as they did before. And I think the reason is that they are afraid of the, the prides in captivity here, uh, so that the young males and the females from outside They've got respect for the lions when they hear them here on the farm. But uh, I remember once uh, two big males came in, I think because they, are, they were able to challenge this lions here. But the younger males and the females don't come. Billy's observations resonate with new research, indicating that the sound of a lion's roar might be used to keep other lions away from fenced farms. Sergei shows no memory of the brutal territorial battles that drove her parents from the central Kalahari game reserve. She doesn't respond to the roars of the captive lions. Perhaps she's staying silent because she's an outsider in another pride's territory. Perhaps her bond with Val has taken her to an existence outside lion society. Perhaps she doesn't recognize the calls because she's communicating differently now. Now, Sega really is, is a lioness that's, that's offspring from lions that are from the wild. So she, she's not a captive uh, bred lion that has been a population that has been in cages for, for a long time. Her, her parents were problem animals on, on cattle farms that walked, walked in here from the central Kalahari Game Reserve. So she basically really is the first generation in captivity and she still has all her senses and what she what she needs in, in nature to, to be able to survive and, and to hunt. And I guess the only, the only problem she has today is that she's, she's just very used to people, um, but maybe not as friendly with everybody as she is with me. Hey, yeah. She goes in here Serga also gets her piece of wildebeest meat. She's still a captive after all. Rescuing Serga has given Val new insight into the complex problems surrounding lions in Africa. She was born because Willy de Graaf captured her parents. But they were wild. They could be returned to nature. Serga can never rejoin her wild pride. 
they would kill her now. She's different. She rinses her meat in the water hole before feeding. She's used to clean fresh food and water. She shows no aggression towards Val, even though the meat is too small to share, because she trusts him. The idealistic young man who took pity on a dying cub has come to terms with the fact that rescuing Serbia has long-term consequences. Only he can help her become the hunter she was meant to be. Only he cares enough to create a hunting ground for her where she can live an independent life. If he succeeds, he will have saved her from a life of boredom and captivity. If he fails, Serga, the young lioness with a hunter's heart, will never run free. But saving Serga will require a dangerous and unprecedented leap into the unknown.